In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Our Chaplain's Report today, it comes from the Book of Judges. Now, one thing that you need to know about Gideon, and I will give you a little bit of backstory just to help all of you understand this. I'm not going to go into the details. You can find his story a few chapters before the reading that we're going to do today. But suffice it to say that Gideon, or as he's called in this particular chapter, uh, Jerubbabel. I know, it's, it's a weird name, but that's what his name is. He has a couple names, just like a lot of Bible characters. He was one of Israel's objectively best judges. He did an awful lot of the things that he was supposed to do. He cast down the altars of foreign gods. He drove out the enemies of Israel when Israel had refused to do so themselves. I mean, by any measure, he's one of the better judges that Israel experienced in their time being under judgeship before the time of kings came a little bit later. But he had two major flaws, and they wound up in a lot of ways undoing a lot of the good that he had done. First of all, he messed around with too many women. And I, I understand the temptation there. That's something that can get a lot of men in trouble. But he had several wives, and because he had so many wives, he had a lot of sons, 70 in fact. So he is obviously with a lot of women, some he was married to, some that were just concubines. But the point is, he's with a lot of women, and that's a bad idea. We can understand this through Jesus actually explaining the same concept in Matthew 19, going all the way back to Genesis. God's design was always a man and a woman together for life, period. There is nothing else that fits God's definition of marriage. And it's amazing to me that when you look through the Old Testament, there are a lot of people that have multiple partners, multiple wives. And every single time, I can't think of an exception to this. Maybe there are some that some other biblical scholars could point out that I can't, but for sure the majority of the time, and with every major Bible character that is reported to have multiple wives, it always ends badly. That's something that I do find very astounding. And the other major flaw is pride. Because we read right before uh, Gideon's death that he had created an ephod for himself. And what an ephod is, is it is a breastplate that was supposed to be worn only by the priest. Now, Gideon was a good judge, but he was not a Levite and he was not a priest. He was not somebody that was permitted, according to the law of Moses, to wear an ephod. And because he had seen himself as somebody who had God's favor and was doing God's work, which were both good things, he took it upon himself to take on a role that God had not allowed him to do. You know, Gideon had so many good things going for him, and he had done so much in the name of the Lord. But at the tail end, he allowed his pride to overtake him. He thought that because he had done so many good things for God, that basically God would let him get away with things and that he would put himself in a position that the Lord had not ordained him to. And unfortunately, there's an awful lot of people that get in trouble with that even today. For example, a lot of women that I, I believe are sincere and good try to take on roles that God has not given to them in the worship service. Not to say they're not talented, like I'm sure Gideon was. Not to say that they're not sincere, like I'm sure Gideon was. He still was not somebody that was permitted to take on the ephod and act as though he was a Levite. That was not a role that God had approved for him. But we see in Judges 9, 5 through 6, that these two errors wound up costing not only him, but the generation after him. And it says there in Judges 9, verses 5 through 6, Then went to his father's house at Ophrah. By the way, this is talking about Gideon's son. Then he went to his father's house at Ophrah and killed his brothers and the sons of Jerubbabel, which is also Gideon, 70 men on one stone. But Jotham, the youngest son of Jerubbabel, was left. For he him hid himself. All the men of Shechem, and all of Bethmelo assembled together 
and they went and made Abimelech king by the oak of the pillar, which was in Shechem. So Abimelech, the son of Gideon, went and killed all of his brothers except for one. There was only one that escaped. Seventy men who were his own flesh and blood did he murder because he wanted his father's prestige and power. By any measure, Gideon was a very good man, but these two flaws were unfortunately things he passed down to his son. And I think that there are a few lessons to be learned from this. First of all, even if you're pretty good, your sins are still going to find you out. There's a lot of people that live good, godly lives, but just like every other person, they're imperfect. And just like every other sin, whether it comes from a pretty good person or an absolutely wretched, despicable person, their sins have consequences. And those consequences hurt not only them, but other people around them. You see, Gideon's sins destroyed his entire family, wiped him out, except for two, his youngest son and his oldest evil son. And Abimelech, his oldest son, did this. And I think that that really shows that, first of all, your parents can't make you a good person. This is something that is shown over and over again throughout the Old Testament. I mean, you could look everywhere from Cain and Abel. You could look at Jacob and Esau, how one son turned out really good and one son really kind of didn't. You could also look through this story. You could look through all the kings of Judah and the kings of Israel. Some of the kings of Judah were really good people, didn't make their children good. There were a lot of really evil kings that were the descendants of Jacob. Or, well, well, all of them were the descendants of Jacob. They were the descendants of David and Solomon. And yet they were pretty evil people. And so that should be a, a warning that your parents cannot make you good, even when your parents do a good job. And I think that Gideon's job was pretty good, but definitely left some room for improvement, especially considering the way that he was with women. This is something that, that really comes back to hurt him and his family later after he's gone. And that's because, ultimately, even if you do raise your kids right, sometimes they just make evil decisions because they are free moral agents as well. Another thing that's important to note here is that polygamy really never works out well with or without marriage. Whether you're talking about in Gideon's situation where there's a whole bunch of people that he slept with, or whether you're talking about something that would be a little bit more modern where you're not necessarily married to a lot of the people, but you sleep around before you find the one that you want to settle down with, that's something that no matter how you slice it, no matter what circumstance surrounds it, it's never a good idea and it never works out well for the people involved. I mean, I could go through all the statistics about how people that sleep around before marriage are less likely to be sexually satisfied in their marriage. They're more likely to get divorced. I mean, there's a laundry list of side effects that come with that. But ultimately, what it boils down to is doing something that is against our nature is not good. And who would know our nature better than the one who actually created us? The one who designed our nature. God didn't tell us this because he wanted it to be a killjoy or he wanted to keep us from having a good time. He did this because he understood it was the right way to live, the one that benefited us the most. That having one partner for all of our lives was the only way to find what he was hoping for us to get out of a marriage. And that doesn't mean that everybody that doesn't do that is, is doomed to a lifetime of horrible relationships and marriages, but it definitely does not set the table in a good way. And it means that there are going to be some hurdles and some difficulties that arrive in your marriage that don't necessarily have to be there if you just follow God's plan. And this situation just wouldn't have happened if... Gideon had done the right thing and stayed with one woman his entire life because maybe Abimelech, I mean, somebody as heartless as Abimelech, might have wound up killing his siblings even if they came from the same mother and father. But the way that the text reads, it seems to suggest that Abimelech was the only son of his mother by Gideon, and all the others were from different women. And based on the way that he treats them, killing his half-brothers and sisters, 
that seems to be the case. Maybe he would have been more reticent if the only brothers and sisters that he had were also his mother's children. I don't know that for sure, but it seems more likely. It at least seems plausible. And finally, and this is something that is a little terrifying, pride can be passed on to your children. Gideon had too much pride, not enough to kill people to get the prestige or the position that he wanted, but enough to raise himself up into a position that he wasn't supposed to have. And unfortunately, that's a trait that Abimelech learned from his father. You see, there wasn't supposed to be a king in Israel. They were supposed to have a judge system, but Abimelech was the son of the closest thing they had to a king. It was a very famous and very prosperous judge, and so he decided that he needed to be king. And because of that, he started setting stuff up to where he could be the king, and there were people that actually did consider him king. The, the verse points that out, that there were people that consider him a king in Israel. He didn't rule over all of Israel, and, and people didn't really recognize his kingship later on. But the point is, that was something that he tried to establish, because he tried to, like his father, put himself in a position that God had not ordained him for, that God did not want him to hold. And at that point, wanted nobody to hold in the kingdom. And looking at all of that, I, I think that it should remind us not to underestimate our own influence. The things that we do, the choices that we make, they influence people around us in ways that we can't predict, in ways that we don't understand, and sometimes even the best influence doesn't end well. But if we're a bad influence, it's certainly not going to end well. And that's something that I think that all of us need to remember and to reconsider when we do things and make choices that affect the people around us. See, like I said, Gideon was a pretty good dude. But when it came right down to it, he was too arrogant, and he messed around with too many women, and that wound up costing him and the nation of Israel dearly. His family suffered a great deal because of those two things. And maybe Abimelech would have turned out to be a murderous, rotten person, even if, a, even if Gideon had been perfect. We don't know. But if nothing else, he wouldn't have had the opportunity to do so, and his father's influence wouldn't have been the thing that drove him to that. That would have been something he got from somewhere else. So I know that this is kind of an odd lesson to do at a time where very few of us are having a lot of social interaction, but maybe this is even more important when, our, when we're quarantined in our households with our families, is to remember the impact of our choices on other people. Are we going to drive them further away from God? Or are we going to be a good influence and inspire them to draw closer to God? Stay the course, friends. It's not exactly a secret that YouTube really doesn't like conservatives, so I'm asking for your help. I don't want to stick it to them. I just genuinely want to show them that conservative voices do matter and that there is a big, passionate audience out there that wants to hear them. So give us a like and subscribe, remembering to click the notification bell, and show YouTube that you do want more content like this. Sincerely, thank you.